Hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Today, inshallah, we will discuss a very important topic because it's very common here in UK. It's not from exam point of view. However, it's a recent talk, so it's important to discuss. All right, so let's go through it. It's sarcoidosis in the pregnancy and it was published in this year, 2024. So some key points regarding the sarcoidosis. What is sarcoidosis? It's multi-system disorder. Usually it's um, characterized by the non-caseating granulomas. So you have to differentiate between the caseating one and non-caseating. The peak age will be between 20 and 40. And the pathogenesis, it's uncertain or unclear. However, it's associated with exaggerated T helper cell. And why this sentence is important? Because we will reflect on that on um, during the pregnancy. How about the disease? Is it like it will be uh, worse or better or it will remain the same? So it will depend on what will happen with the T helper cell during pregnancy. Suppression of the T helper cell, so during the pregnancy will lead to the disease remission. That's why it's very important to know some of the theories regarding the pathogenesis of sarcoidosis. It's usually associated with risk for the mother, the baby, especially if the mother started to have complications be before the pregnancy, like to have brain involvement or heart cardiac involvement. Usually the most common place is the pulmonary or the lungs. So pulmonary involvement, this is the most common presentation for any patient with sarcoidosis. But in some patients also, the heart might be affected, the brain, the CNS, the cranial nerves, and the skin as well. Uh, regarding the ethnic groups, the Black African origin, they will experience more severe disease. The mortality, it's around 5 to 10 percent, and usually it's secondary to neuro or cardiac sarcoidosis. Pathogenesis, uncertain as we mentioned, and um, it's the, the disease represents an exaggerated immune response to unknown triggers. So we don't know why there is a, there, there is like exaggerated response that trigger is unknown. What about the clinical features? We mentioned that it will depend on the site. Most commonly, it's pulmonary or the involvement of the lung. So many patients will present asymptomatic without any symptoms. Some patients will present with the lung involvement. This is the most common presentation in around more than 90% of those affected. So many patients will be asymptomatic. From the people who will, who will be symptomatic, 90% or more will present with pulmonary disease, what we named interstitial lung disease. And usually, this patient will suffer from fibrosis after that, lung fibrosis or parenchymal fibrosis. Um, sometimes with this fibrosis, what will happen as a consequence like event, the pulmonary artery will showing pulmonary artery hypertension, which is contraindicated during pregnancy. So it's wise before the pregnancy in such patients in the preconceptional clinic to offer them echocardiogram, ECG, and MRI to just to rule out the problem like pulmonary hypertension and also to know if this patient will be, um, she's competent to be pregnant or not, or the pregnancy will affect her health. Extra pulmonary symptoms, usually the joints, the liver, skin, heart, brain, and eyes. Skin, this is the most common extra pulmonary. So mo some patients will come asymptomatic. From the symptomatic, more than 90% will be pulmonary involvement. The next common side or the next one will be the skin disease. Around 50% of the patients will experience cardiac symptoms. It's not necessary to be cardiac involvement, but just cardiac symptoms like syncope. Arrhythmia in around 2 to 7%. Central nervous system involvement, especially the cranial nerves, and this patient will present with facial nerve palsy, optic nerve dysfunction, or papilledema. Why all this um, clinical manifestation is important? Because if we will face a situation like this in the clinic or in the exam, ask the patients about all these symptoms to rule out the uh, pulmonary disease, the cardiac disease, the nervous system disease, and so on. 
How to diagnose the sarcoidosis? It's usually diagnosis of exclusion. We need three major criteria to apply. Number one, clinical presentation. Number two, non-caseating granulomas in the tissue sample when we offer tissue sampling. And exclusion of other granulomatous disease. How are you gonna manage this patient? So usually any of the, the any patient with sarcoidosis, she will be under the multidisciplinary team. If this patient will come to the preconceptional clinic, again, you will offer her MDT. If she will come during the pregnancy, again, MDT. What to offer? What about the investigations we can offer? Chest radiographs, we can offer the chest X-ray just to see like bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy, fibrosis, secondary to pulmonary infiltration. If we cannot pick the diagnosis here, we can offer the CT, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage. You will find like the cells in the in this lavage it can be examined under the microscope. Trans -bi uh, bronchial biopsy, it can be done by the bronchoscopy. Very important. So it's one of the criteria to find the non caseating granuloma in the tissue biopsy. The MRI, MRI of the chest, MRI of the heart, cardiac MRI, or MRI of the brain. So brain MRI. So we can offer chest X-ray, if not clear, CT, and we can offer bronchoscope. We can take the sample and also lavage and MRI for the chest or for the heart, for the brain. We can also depend on the serum angiotensin converting enzyme. It will be altered in the sarcoidosis However, during pregnancy, if this is preconceptional, yes, we can depend on that. But during pregnancy, this level will be altered, will be changed. So that's why it cannot be used during the pregnancy. Echocardiogram, echocardiography, just to be sure that the heart is not involved. Cardiac MRI, just to see the edema, the fibrosis, the scarring, and also brain MRI, or if it's not conclusive, we can offer cerebrospinal fluid analysis. So very important to, to know what to offer a preconceptional, just to be sure that the functions of all organs are okay, so you can allow the pregnancy. How about management of the sarcoidosis in the pregnancy? Again, it's multidisciplinary team, and we need to optimize the patient, the, the current condition with the medication, review her medication, and for sure it has to be done in the preconception setting, Baseline review, function, disease activity, pulmonary function test will reveal the function of the lung, uh, full blood count, urea and electrolytes, liver function test, serum calcium and ACE, in, and ACE levels, baseline ECG, echocardiogram, 24-hour holter monitor, optimization of the medical um, like medical management, like any medications the patient she's, uh, she's using. And also, uh, we have a range of medication. Not all of it is safe during the pregnancy. And here will come the most important point in how to review the medications. Uh, the patient with a flare during the pregnancy, we can offer her the high-dose oral corticosteroids. It's safe to be used. However, it will increase the risk of the gestational diabetes. So at that time, offer screening for this patient between 24 to 26 weeks. Um, and also it will, if the patient will take for more than two weeks, we need to give her the stress dose during labor. So this is regarding the steroid. After the, after the flare up, once the patient is stable, now we can shift her to the lower dosage of corticosteroids. We have what we name a disease modifying drugs like methotrexate, mycophenolate, uh, leflumide, leflunamide and other thioprene. Is it all safe? No. Methotrexate? No, we cannot use it. Even we need to stop it 12 weeks before the pregnancy. And I will come to this point because there is like a conflict point here, confusing point. It's different in this TUG article from other TUG articles and from the BNF. Um, mycophenolate? Again, no. Leflunamide? No. Other thioprene? Yes, you can use it. So when you will come back to, to say which medication we can give, so two medications here, the steroids and other thioprene. Rarely we may need infliximab. 
how if it's if it's required or needed we can give but please stop it as early as the third trimester or by the end of the second trimester right so methotrexate mycophenolate not safe during pregnancy during breastfeeding methotrexate will increase the risk of miscarriage fetal structure abnormalities and it's secreted in the breast milk so it's better to be avoided for the mycophenolate we need to stop it six weeks prior to the pregnancy. For the methotrexate, it's written in this talk article, guys, that we need to stop it four weeks. And here I put like two question marks. Why? Because it's still 12 weeks in the BNF. We have to depend on this in UK. If you need to know anything about any medication, just for example, um, in the search or in the Google search or any place, just note down or write methotrexate BNF and it will come out. It's working here only in UK. So in the BNF, it's still 12 weeks. So in the exam, because as I told you, it's a confusing point since this talk article was out or was published. So keep it 12 weeks as per the, the BNF. High dose folic acid, don't forget, five milligram daily should be continued up to 12 weeks of the pregnancy. So this is one of the indications of the high dose folic acid. Leflunomide contraindicated in pregnancy. So just to recap or summarize, it will be just the steroid and other thiopurine. Moving backward one more time, by the end of this talk article, you'll find management, preconception, uh, antenatal, intrapartum, postpartum. So let's recap all the information. Preconception, what we need to do, optimize the management of the disease by reviewing the medication just to see what about the activity of the, uh, the disease and also if there is any problem with any function like the pulmonary function. Baseline test, as we mentioned in the all investigations you have to offer in the preconception uh, settings. Consideration of the underlying function. Don't forget the pulmonary function test to be offered in the clinic for all the patients. Antenatal care, a high risk care pathway multidisciplinary team don't forget in terms of multidisciplinary team guys it's not just a team no multidisciplinary team so there is increased risk of preeclampsia fetal growth restriction so we need to offer aspirin from 12 weeks we have problem with the calcium and vitamin d usually here because this country is not uh, sunny there is clouds all the time so usually we are prescribing vitamin d for the pregnant ladies but in sarcoidosis Avoid this. Why? Because we have abnormal calcium metabolism. Serial ultrasound growth surveillance, yes, indicated because there is risk of growth restriction. And we have to offer this patient fortnightly, like every two weeks assessment from 24 weeks, and then to be weekly from 32 weeks. VTE risk assessment, thromboprophylaxis, we have to offer. Why? Because one of the problems with the sarcoidosis there is increased risk of VTE, okay? Venous thromboembolism with the preeclampsia, with the fetal growth restriction as well. So that's why we need to assess the risk and to offer thromboprophylaxis. Intrapartum care, again, multidisciplinary team. We may need to consider early delivery if we have severe active disease, which will require more aggressive medical therapy. Sarcoidosis alone is not an indication for cesarean section, but if it's indicated for any uh, obstetric causes or if we have any severe neural affection or a nervous system affection, at that time we can offer cesarean section. Vaginal delivery can be shortened by an instrumental delivery. Neurosarcoidosis means affection of the nervous system might increase the intracranial pressure. At that time, vaginal delivery is contraindicated. So we need to go to, to cesarean section. We need to use oxygen, yes, because it will get benefits, especially for the patients with interstitial lung disease. Fluid management, yes, but it, we need to keep it like careful fluid management because we are afraid of the peripartum, postpartum heart failure. So in terms of the intrapartum care, what we need to know, we might consider early delivery. Usually we will offer normal vaginal delivery. Sometimes we will offer an instrument ju just to make 
the vaginal delivery short. Caesarean section for obstetric causes severe neural affection because of the increased intracranial pressure and it's contraindicated to go with the vaginal delivery. Oxygen, yes, especially with the lung disease. Fluid management, yes, but we have to use meticulous way to reduce the risk of peri or postpartum heart failure. Postnatal, the risk of flare will increase postnatal, right? Remember this disease, the sarcoidosis and also the MS. The MS, the patient, the multiple sclerosis, the patient will be well controlled during the pregnancy. Usually the risk of relapse is minimal. Here again, it's the same. However, the most risky period will be the postnatal period because we have increased risk of the flare-up. We need to continue on the, the medications the patient she's on, okay? And to see the safety profile of all the medications during breastfeeding involve the pediatrician, the neonatologist in, with you here in the multidisciplinary team. Early follow-up with the medical team and don't forget the postnatal contraception for this patient. Okay, so this is all about the sarcoidosis. I try to make it like as much as I can to be easy. Um, I wish it's a benefit for all of you guys and best of luck, inshallah, in your exam. Uh, pray for each other and best of luck. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.